This is the Bar Stewards Enquiry. You are talking absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. In, in what way? You are an underachiever in life. You were, I saved your bacon one time. You were gone. You had to that well. I couldn't save you. I, I said, oh, no, but you said the right thing. But well, that's why you don't know anything about racing, John. I, I didn't say I do. Right? I'm saying that... What, what have you contributed to racing? You are one of these take-out merchants. Take out all you can. Hello. A very big warm welcome this week to the Bastard's Sunday Sermon. The weather is terrible. A hot toddy is needed, but you've got us to warm your cockles and hopefully put a smile on your face, even if it's only for a minute as we're not totally shit. Good evening, yes. John and Chris, joining me for this action-packed show. Good evening. Imagine we're gently cupping your cockles and warming them. <laughs> Bet you don't watch his hands, though. That's the problem. No. Nah, <laughs> Before or after. <laughs> Indeed. Onwards and upwards to this week's show. There's not exactly a lot of news other than industry news in the racing world, but we shall start the show off, as always, just having a quick look at yesterday, which sort of, there was a little bit of interest, I think, for Cheltenham in terms of what happened yesterday. I'd like to ask Johnny's opinion on this. The two races in question, John, were obviously the Sil Vignaco Conti Chase, at Kempton, first of all, where Bambridge got the better of good front-running jumping peak Dohey in the closing stages. What did you make of that performance, John? Bambridge could only beat what was in front of him. I mean, I think you can put a line through everything else for Cheltenham in that race. Yep. Bambridge, what price is he for Cheltenham now? Because in my book, that they made him seven or eight to one. Best price, five to one each way, a pleasure. That's um... thin enough, I think. I'll give you a take on this. I I think that Bambridge is a lot better than what he looks. Because if you if you watch him in all his races, he's not the type of horse to street clear and destroy the opposition, if you know what I mean. In fact, if you look at his entire career, when he's been winning races in his younger days and progressing through the ranks, he never destroys the opposition. And I like this because I think this horse is saving something up his sleeve. For example, he got up sides peak door or just on his shoulders just before the second last. And you thought, right, this is where you'll, you'll probably pummel this from here because you've done everything right. You've had a nice trip, just going a nice lead throughout the race. And you'll probably just go away and stretch clear. And then everyone has been waxing lyrical. But I think, you know, when he gets to the front, I don't think he does a deal. No, maybe not. I just, I just think when when you look at the racing post ratings that they've, they've been rattling up, say, over the last six runs, you know, he's still got a fair bit of mileage to make up on Hallethorpe. Yes. I don't think Farsha one's screaming value for him to do that. No, I, I agree with you. There's absolutely no point in playing at that price. Unless you've got Hallethorpe as an on runner on the day, he's, gonna, he's not going to be five to two, is he, or anything? And... Don't get me wrong. I, I have my doubts that Aloha will ever come back to his best, to be honest, because I don't think he was at his best at Kempton. Mm. But that said, even a five pound below farm Aloha still has an average racing post rating better than Bandridge. He, he's got to improve again. Five to one for him to improve again doesn't appeal as a better. No, I'm in your camp there, but. I do respect the horse because I think to pick that horse up around Kempton, which is not easy to do when they get in a good rhythm and peaked or he did jump relatively well bar in the last mm. when he got the last wrong. I, I think that's a smart performance. Don't get me wrong. If somebody shot 10 to 1 up, I'd back him. You would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's all about price, isn't it? It is. So that's me and John's take on Bambridge, but... Obviously, if you have backed Bambridge anti-post at, say, bigger prices, certainly quite a heartwarming performance that if he makes the Ryanair on the day. Right, we move over to Warwick, where we had a very good novice chase, the Hampton. This was a blinding race, really, with the front three, possibly the four in the market that, you know, set a very reasonable standard for a British novice chase, shall we say. Obviously, a very impressive from Grey Dawn in John. Your take on it? I thought the second and third probably knocked spots off each other early enough. They did. That would be my worry with that. Um, also, I, I don't know if these three would have enough, like what I call, seasoning on them 
for a, a Cheltenham Championship novice. No, the, obviously the race that Grey Dawning would likely participate in is the Brown Advisory, and that's where you've got a lot of top-class three-mile yeah. chases in Ireland. And whilst that was a good performance, he did have the run nicely on the rail while the front two, they butchered them two. We did mention on Friday's pod about Broadway Boy not missing a dance this year, and he definitely felt it more after some what we, we thought were tough races he's had. He's uh, a typical twist of season over there December, isn't he? Yeah. Broadway Boy now, in my opinion, is done for the season. In fact, if I earned him, you'd take him away for starters, but <laughs> if I earned him, I would say, do you know what? Let's bring him back next year. Let's do something different. I just think that'll have flattened him again, don't you? I can't say it's done him any good. What did you think to the mayor, which was obviously our klaxon bet, Apple away? She she obviously had to work very hard to put, put him away. I thought she jumped nice. She's not top class, but I think she's a really likeable mayor. Do you agree? I think if you... I mean, it's all race independent, isn't it? You know what I mean? She, she might go up a bit for that, but if not, you could maybe find a nice novice in the spring where you get a decent size field and you can switch her off a bit. I think that... The current map's workable at any rate. Yeah, she's a nice mare. And to be honest, you know, like it looks like a, a terrible bet because obviously when we said it on Friday, we thought Apple Away would win with the allowance. But I think if you say Broadway Boys and non runner, would Grey Dawning have been able to do that to her in the closing stage? Well, they might have stuck her on a bit earlier. Yeah. Again, it's horses for courses, but I've no doubt that Grey Dawning were the best horse anyway, despite the trip. You know, I mean, races like that, you're a bit hostage how they're going to be running. If somebody decides to take a confirmed leader on, you're very much in the lap of the gods, aren't you? You know, it wouldn't have been my plan. You know, I'm sure we're losing the Russell and Sco. I have a lot more idea than me, but uh, no, the fuck it, of course I don't. Um, no. But I wouldn't have been taking on Broadway by to the extent that I played did. Yeah. Veterans Chase, John, John, did you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah, I loved it, yeah. <laughs> well, we man. Yeah, well, Sam Brown won it, and that's when you shouted stop, didn't you? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <Aye, Ray. laughs> Career all night, no. It's like the comedy club. Look at this. The quality yeah. is off. I, I, I thought right. Adam's tip ran well in that. Lord the Mesnil, because I, I class Warwick as quite a sharp test when they, they're going down the back there with that horrible row of fences. I think if he gets a bit of sloppy ground at Haydock in something three mile plus before the end of the season, I think he could do a bit of damage. He's still in good nick, I think. Agree with all that. We'll go move on to a few questions, and these are more racing related that, that you've put forward rather than the daft ones at the end. They're all daft. Any idiot listens to this shit, it's got something wrong with them, I think. I don't even listen to this shit. N- never mind this shit. It's not totally shit. It's not. No, okay, p- partially shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I know it's not Nick Luck, but you know, we're, we're, we're trying. Who is? Who yeah. is Nick Luck? I, yeah. I listened to that podcast. He's got such syrupy tones, doesn't he? You kind of nod off after a quarter of an hour. He's that smooth, I think. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like listening to a tirade of the pan pipes. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Played in a shopping centre by a bloke selling CDs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? There used to be a spray that years ago. You could people playing the pan pipes in shopping centres. Uh, 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 selling, sell, selling CDs. Who did that uh, Sky Burt song? It. Was it Roger Whittaker? That's it, Roger Whittaker. Yeah, like, the whistler, wasn't he? The whistle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My that... dad used to love him. He thought my dad thought that the highest form of human achievement was whistling. <laughs> Fuck it, now he's back with us. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. You don't get this on Nick Luck, I promise Ex- you. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> quite anyway. Digressing. <laughs> yeah, massively. Let's get some questions out of the way. And uh, Speed Bandits. Went to Warwick mm. and at thirty-three pounds, double carpet. Uh, he paid walk-up price. Yeah, double carpet. They're getting a pretty average card at Warwick. Oh, that's another thing. Just going on about the quality of fields yesterday, John. We're really feeling it now, aren't we? Quite a lot because this Warwick card used to be really comp- like you even said on Friday night. That Potemp used to be. It used to be a ripper. That Potemp. There was actually some people that wanted to win it. And- 
Yeah, well, I was did... having a good size crowd, four places, and caught the odds, you know, and it was, it was all right. Well, McManus ran the staying hurdle winner in that a couple of years ago, I think. Like I say, it's, for whatever reason, it's declining, whereas Gavin Cromwell, the shrewdy, is now deciding that he's going to target a lot of his horses at British races because of the sheer lack of competitiveness. To be honest, more Irish should be switched on on this because our big handicaps at the minute uh, not that great, to say the least. I, I'm on about strength in depth rather than there'd be two or three at the top of the market that are quite sexy. But apart from that, it's mostly fodder. Yeah, so 33 quid. What we're saying to 33 quid is a walk up price, Chris. That's a lot of dough, isn't it? I mean, it's, 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 it's Warwick. I mean, it's not the most charming of tracks. I mean, it's not really middling. And, you know, in the current climate, 33 pounds just to walk to the door, let alone betting money, food, and drink. And if you to the door, let alone betting money, food and drink. And if you've got your partner with you, 66 notes to get in and watch racing. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I really do think but that. And just plus that, if you take your partner to Warwick, you, it's not going to be your partner for very long. <laughs> well, you might live in Warwick. You might be taking them home to Warwick. <laughs> There's no wonder Adam Norman put, puts his corned beef and pick Lily down. He's sucked them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, look, you, you can see why people smuggle food and drink in. I mean, that is a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah. You know, all right, Saturday and, you know, whatever. But it's not top class racing. It's not the most charming of courses. And people are going skin, aren't they? Well, I'll tell you my problem. It's not that I don't want to support race courses in no. terms of like their food, you know, whatever their, their you just drink. want a freebie. Come on, Warwick, no, send no, us some free no. tickets and we'll review you. Five no, stars. no, I have to take the dodgy umbrella in <laughs> that we pour gin in, <laughs> disguise an umbrella. <laughs> the reason being, most tracks, they don't have the premium gins on. They'll have like Gordon's. Oh, and, uh, Bombay Sapphire and all that. And in, no, mm. in terms of gin, Gordon is not alive. No, he's got bells. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's absolutely dire. And, and so you have to take your own in. So by any means, umbrellas, whatever. There's lots of tricks. And I urge race goers to entertain themselves by trying to be the Gestapo of race Can goers. Can we have a competition for a mug? Best, best smuggling of gin. Yes. <laughs> Listen, not only that, right, if we get something interesting this week, I love a story or a tale, right? I want the best smuggling stories on Twitter. And I will give away oh, a fifty pound free bet, honestly, and a bar stewards limited edition mug. How about that? That is that is a prize. Value, value that is. Don't get that on me, look. Value, value that is. That is something that I want to hear because I love the smuggling in of food and drink stories and what you've done to do it. Yeah, I, there's nothing wrong with it. It's brilliant. We love getting one over the race courses on that. Uncle Rural Garmer could win that, couldn't he? <laughs> What by he, he, well, he, he can smuggle his phone in on a dog lane, walking it in. <laughs> I'm gonna say it with roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you've not heard that before, it's Uncle Rural Gourmet on YouTube. He, an, an alternative cooking show, mainly donkey and testing. Chinese and... any fucking thing now. <laughs> And funny, yeah, but if, yeah, but if you put fifty chilies, <laughs> that's in, in true. The, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, could, it could be. You really can't taste it oh, anyway. <laughs> Enough chilies, and it tastes always quite nice. Chili con carne. He's actually like done it. that before. He's, yeah, done, he's that. done buffalo shit. Yeah, he's done Has buffalo he? dung. Yeah, 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 he's at that. Oh, <laughs> Christ almighty. <laughs> back to racing, of yes, course. Right. Back to racing. Uh, Tony oh. Earnshaw, sad to see Mark Slater retiring in March. Yes, I like Mark Slater as a commentator. I guess we will get more shouty man. He, he said in, in his place. Yeah, sad to see Mark Slater. I thought there were a few more years in him yet. Yeah. He's obviously bored of the game, unlike Tomo, who will probably go on until he's... <laughs> go on after he's dead, won't he? Yeah. He'll have pre-recorded commentaries released, I think. Tomo will keep going on until he looks like that skeleton in the Scotch advert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the record's not fade away. Yeah, really really not that fade away, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, as long as the fee involved, of course, Tomo, Tomo will be there. Oh, oh, there's a fee, is there? Lovely, lovely, lovely. <laughs> Good stuff, right? F funny from Lenny. He says, um, of the racing media and racing influences, what trade would they do if they weren't in racing? Oh. He said blogger, plumber, but I, I liked a suggestion on John's questions thread where he said he was like club 18 to 30 rep. I think. Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, I like that. That You can imagine that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, going through some of them, who can we think of here? Uh, I think Julie Harrington, school dinner lady. <laughs> Yeah, Honestly. yeah, she could, she could serve up the old cornflake tart and custard. Yeah, 
you know. Spot, spot dick and custard, only one slice each, move along. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Ian Mark, Kate Tracy for the WWF after she agreed to wrestle Fry over the Hurricane Fly comment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She, mm. I, I think she, in mud. I think, yeah. she, I think for some reason she liked to kick fuck out of Fry. I don't know why. Mm. I mean, poor Fry. We, Foxy boxing. We could promote that, couldn't we? I, I, I prefer <laughs> to do it in mud, like, cooking oil. Yeah, yeah, something. like... <laughs> Get that Chinese fella to get the oil in the old pan and yeah. lose it gets bits in the wok. Video yeah. available on Patreon. Yeah. Maybe do it where they're, they're playing Twister or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Deviant. This, this is absolutely terrible. Game, that. Terrible for me. Yeah, it's now, now it takes rather than this time to degenerate. <laughs> it does, actually. It's quite quick. I'm enjoying it. And, I'm, and, yeah. and to be honest, I haven't even got going with the gin yet. No. Anyway, next question. Watching coverage from Maidan and Riyadh this week, are the BHA missing a trick with these Premier Race days not being pushed on new platforms? YouTube for nothing, for example, as maybe, I don't know, promoting the sport via a stream under their own presentation format, maybe, like Maidan do it and Riyadh do it with their own, like, I, I've seen it on YouTube, I've seen the, the stream, and it, it's quite good. I, I, I do admit, it, you know, you get plenty of coverage of the horses and stuff, and is the mileage for that? Yeah, though. probably. I mean, I, I don't know the technicalities of it, but yeah, I mean, at first blush, that seems like a sensible idea, but I, I'm sure there are commercial considerations that prevent that. Mm. The trouble with it, I mean, when you, um, I forget how it was that raised the question, but um, are the BHA missing a trick? When when was the last time the BHA showed any interest whatsoever in promoting another authority's product? Mm. Yeah, good point, yeah. I mean, they don't seem well that interested in whether we're going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> <Duh. laughs> <laughs> I mean, let, let, let them get going with British racing first. I think it's a bit yeah, of a stretch. Yeah, they need nice to see them promote our stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> give I, them a few years of that. Yeah. There we go. Thanks for that question, Benjamin. I mean, you know what you get with this shower running the sport. Yeah. Spotted dick and custard. We'll mm. come to the industrial talk in a little while just before we get there Bryony frost today resurfaced with an article in the times suggesting that she was being underused in terms of trainers not putting her up since the the robbie dunn bullying affair that took place a few years ago where robbie dunn was banned for 18 months initially reduced to 10 months after appeal and obviously robbie dunn served his time there for obviously bullying Bryony in a very unfortunate helicopter incident in in the old, <laughs> the old locker, yeah, he, the old locker room. He never take the foot off the ground. I heard it was that good. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Bryony <laughs> obviously had to had to suffer what she described herself as uh, misogyny in yeah. in the weighing room, and you have to respect that kind of thing. An, an independent panel found that she had been bullied and suffered abuse over time, and these things should be looked at very seriously. How? And it's 2024. I mean, were that to happen in any other workplace, in any other industry, you go, well, yeah, she's been bullied. And, oh, yeah. And, and, you know, that's, it's, it's, it seems to be not unique to racing, but it does seem racing people just can't get a handle on it, can they? They can't accept that they're, they're not living in the current times, culturally. Yeah, what's your thoughts on this, job? I think a lot of this comes back to the way racing has been allowed to operate for, for years and years and years. I mean... Going back to the appointment of Dad O'Hardin, for example. <laughs> now, the Jockey Club have something called the Royal Charter, which means they can basically operate in any which way they want, because it is perceived... Like Clint Eastwood, is that the, that yeah, the yeah, sequel? It's, we... <laughs> it's kind of perceived that regardless of anything, they will act in the best interest of racing. So they don't have to um, show due diligence as regards recruitment processes, they don't have to show any clarity on recruitment processes, so on and so forth. And I think that kind of attitude is a bit endemic throughout the industry, to be honest, where they don't feel as though they're answerable to the rail world. Yeah. And, like, racing should make its own laws. Because, I mean, it's, it's perfectly clear, if this had happened in a normal workplace, Dunn would be looking for a different job in a different industry. And amending his CV pretty sharply as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. You, you know, but that said, 
the business about Granny Frost being underused, I think you need to address that with their actual achieved or expected stats. Yeah. To see whether she's been yeah. underused. Well, I actually did. Um, so you mean? Uh, well, because obviously we, we want to see, don't we? We want to know. We all want to know if Brownie Frost is not getting used by trainers as she should do. So I did. So I looked. There was absolutely zero evidence to suggest that anything in that article recorded. In fact, the stats used in the Times were actually false. In 2023, she had 233 rides and 41 winners, which is variance allowed. He's nearly on par with what she's done in previous years. A record number of rides in a season is 340. But she's also had years where she's had 149, 259. So obviously it varies depending on injuries and how motivated the jockey herself is to work throughout the 12 months of the calendar year. So to quote the the stats, I think, is steering the article in a certain direction and trying to get a certain reaction, if I may say so. To back that up, the article carried on stating about lack of grade one opportunities. So I checked that as well. And she had a peak year in 2021 where she had 10 grade one rides and three winners, which, of course, were Griantine and Frodon. Since then, she hasn't rode a grade one winner, but she still had 10 grade one rides in the last two years. Tell me another female jockey that's riding at the moment, barring Blackmore, in the UK based, that's had more than 10 grade one rides in the last two years. Mm -hmm. There ain't one. So if that's hard done to, I don't know what is. However, I'll address the point about is she underused? Yes, she is. And she's underused on a certain type of horse which is a horse that likes to get into a rhythm and goes from the front end. You only need to see Frodon, the ride on Il Redoto, when she was just touched off by Fugitive. Very unfortunate to get touched off. She's very skilled, and she's a very skilled horsewoman. But don't be fooled by these outlier journalists that write in mainstream media that can't read statistics, that haven't got a clue when it comes to reading numbers. That's what I do. That's my living. And I don't want to sound conceited there, but it is. And I'm sick and tired of being quoted stats by the likes of the Gambling Commission, other bodies that are absolute bullshit. And this is another typical bullshit article to rise the bait, if you like, for people to say, oh, yes, misogyny in racing. We don't know there's misogyny in racing. We don't know what's going off in the changing room or or still to this day. No one does unless someone shouts up and... Uh, and Don's hidden something. camera tells us all we need to know that you're stuck <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still going strong, that. Yeah, <laughs> you get the point, chaps. She's not She's not underused oh. in terms of number of rides, from what I can see. And as for trainers deserting her, that's another misnomer. As in, she's only had certain trainers of her back in her anyway, which are Paul Nichols, McPherson, Lucy Wadham, Neil King. Fair enough, Neil King doesn't use them much these days. But then that's no loss because Neil King's barely trained a winner in the last two years. No, he's he's got on the top list, didn't he? Yeah, I don't see a problem. If I I saw it in the stats, I'd say so on the show. I'd say, yes, this this backs it up. This really backs this article up. But it doesn't in any shape or form. So for me, it's just clickbait bollocks. Sorry, that's how how I see it. And I'm not saying that Brian, he hasn't suffered it throughout this because she has, but to say that she's not getting used because of this is rubbish, because all these big yards, yes. John and Chris, have their own jockeys. Harry Cobden Nichols, Harry yep. Skelton, Dan Skelton, Nigel Twiston Davis, Sam Twiston Davis, plus others, Tom Cannon maybe. So, so you've got lots of yards that have their own people in yep. there and will ride out every day for that yard, riding those horses, schooling those horses. You no. can't just say, oh, well, we'll put Bryony on. That's my point. I think she's had a fair crack of the whips. Looking at a number of rides, she's had she's had a lot of rides as a national hunt jockey. I think she's done very well, and yeah. she's a perfectly good horsewoman. She really is on a certain type of horse. Would I back her on a hold up horse in a big handicap hurdle? No. Would I back her on a front runner at Wing Canton, where I know she'll be out and away, yeah. getting a horse in a rhythm? Absolutely, loop. Like it's honest speak here on this show as always. Right. We shall move on. Parliamentary debate on the 26th of February. Thank you to the 100,000 signatures that that the public garnered to discuss affordability checks, chaps. What's going to happen with that, Chris? I don't know. They'll have a chat on the 26th, I suppose. (laughs) You know, I find find that the business of 
prediction in in this really really difficult. I mean, I just don't see any change in the um, our favourite expression, the general direction of travel. I, I think the, <laughs> I think these are little stages that have to go through to give the illusion that all sides of the debate are being considered. But I think the answer's already written, and they're just going through a, a series of stages just to legitimise the decision we all know they're going to come to, I think. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. No, I think I think you're bang on. I've seen these parliamentary debates before. It's usually scheduled for 3.23pm when they've all fucked off. There's, there's about seven sat there, yeah. four are asleep, one's, yeah. one's had marijuana, there's the one speaking, and then yeah. there's one person yeah. listening. And, and there's um, one always <laughs> don't want to go home because his missus has got the amp, so he thought he'd stay at work for a bit longer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly that. Yeah, or he's got a train yeah. at like nine o'clock at <laughs> night. One. He thinks, well, there's <laughs> yeah, no exactly. point leaving yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, cheap train. So there we go. So that that's where we think on the parliamentary bit. John, can you see nothing coming to this? I can't. Can you? I think I think Gove might wander in, coked off his tit, <laughs> thinking, thinking he's got my questions to answer about Tay's works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, be, yeah. About it, I think. Begin the set. The, well, the narrative set. And the only people I can see speaking up for racing would tend to be the type of economic nutters that I generally despise who would put the economy before everything. Yeah. And they'll get shouted down anywhere. Yes. Not caring about people. So yeah. I'm not particularly hopeful of this doing any good. And this sort of proves it because this week a slots firm got fined £6 million pounds by the Gambling Commission on social welfare and responsibility. Wow. And I looked through the charge list, and yeah, some of them were quite damning. I think someone did about 60 grand in, someone did about 30 grand in. But there was one that, that they'd charged them on. I found that this is like a warning sign for everyone here. It was a new account, and over, a, I think it was a period of six weeks, the account went unchecked to lose £6,000. To me, that's not a vast sum of money. And I'm not speaking for everybody. To some people, £6,000 would be a lot of money. But I, I'm saying yeah. in the grand scheme of things, over six weeks, I don't think that's a lot of money personally. But uh, am I right to suggest that or not? I think it's a lump. But, I mean, again, you can argue persuasively that in the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot. But I suppose for... for vulnerable sections of society. Well, it's man that's only got right. seven hours, it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's a chunk of dough to, to be knocking out on the slots, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, you can argue, sorry, but my, my, I think it's quite a lot of money, yeah. Right, okay. The only thing with that is, that finishes the likes of me, doesn't it? Because if they're using these as... Yeah, it does. If they're using these as test cases and they're not distinguishing from gameplay on that, slots. And that's the point. As I said, on, on, on slots, that's a lot of dough because, as we know, slots is a purely a game of chance with a, with an inbuilt advantage, a percentage advantage to the house. You know, And that's the problem, isn't it? You know, should differentiate between sports wagering and, you know, games of chance and, you know, online roulette. Well, if, if an affordability check was actually an affordability check, yeah. Yeah. everybody would be all right. Yeah. Yes. Then look at Lee's net profit over however, however, however long he's been on Betfair, for example. Yeah. Allow for his living costs. And this man makes money, so it's all right. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. So that's fine. Know, and that's the problem, yeah. isn't it? Exactly. And that that that, that would. That's all that needs to be applied, really, a little bit of common sense. But but it's not an affordability check in the way that you've described it. That, that's the problem, is it? That, that's, Isn't it? that's the thing. No. It's not mm. an affordability check. It's uh, we're looking to cut down fucking gambling in this country because yes. you're all having yeah. so much fun with your money and it's yeah. going in other areas like Prems, Gas and Licky. Yeah, but John's right. I mean, he's absolutely right. It's nothing to do with with how skilled you are, how profitable you are, or to what extent gambling is or isn't making, uh, you know, having an impact on your your lifestyle. It's about gambling's bad, so let's find ways of cutting it down. And, you know, you get things like, oh, he's spending too much on gambling. Well, how much is too much? 
you know, six grand to Bernie Eccleston, you wouldn't say, oh, fuck me, that's too much, would you? No. So it's not it's not nuanced enough. And the problem is because to, to do proper affordability checks is cost intensive, it's time resource, and you just don't have the time or the, or the resources to do it properly. So they're going to rely on, as you say, you know, Romanian fucking te- teleoperators or algorithms. So hmm. Stephen Thomas has been on, he said he's had nine betting accounts enjoyed the challenge over the years all these accounts have been eroded he's not had an online bet since ebo day and he says few bets he has are now in the shop very sad and this is probably a recreational punter that does okay not a professional but just a keen advocate of the sport i think it's really sad how this has been allowed to materialize and we'll come on to this now as to, as to probably why it has mm. by explaining some mathematics behind this a couple of facts here Martin Crudus has been on this week with a media rights spiel defending ARC in terms of he does not want to state how much money they are receiving from the media rights deal, which are paid to British racecourses in terms with turnover by the books. Now, they get 3% of what is turned over by the books. I think that's a monstrous figure, as in we don't know what that figure is across the boards, but the fact that they're not willing to say, Chris, John, yeah. is that quite damning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously it, it's going to be a figure where British Racing and the BHA are going to say... <gasps> <laughs> that's Uncle um, Albert, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You, you know, the wall. Well, yeah. I can't blame Crudus for acting in the way he is because this is business. Yeah. The BHA seem to want to operate in this world where the clouds are made of candy floss and everybody cooperates and everybody chunks up information about their business to help the BHA enhance their business yeah and it doesn't work like that no it's never worked like that we've never had consensus in this game and it indicates how badly placed we are with the people that's in charge of the bha now because what we need we don't need to be taking a poodle to a dog fight we need a big xl bully going there and yeah. we need to do some damage yeah. and we, we ain't got the bodies i'm afraid no. I agree regarding Crudus. He has literally turned Ark around. Looking at his his history, he's obviously a very clever man. However, racing doesn't really need big corp industry clever men fighting against Julie Arrington and crew. No, it's like a to- <laughs> it's a total mismatch. Yeah, she's just throw custard at him, I reckon. That's what she's doing. <laughs> it's a gelatinous against a tennis racket, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great analogy, John. Although Crudus made our top four for Bastard of the Year for the industry, I was merely referring to the fact that this man, obviously, is not acting in the interests of racing. You know, no. I care about racing. He yeah. claims... Somebody, somebody can be a bastard, but they'll be a top bastard, can't they? Well, yeah. well, well, that's it. Yeah. He's paid to do a job, and he's doing it. You know, he, he, if, if he was employed by someone else, he would use those skills to advance the business yeah, of yeah. no, they're not. And, no, and they're that's what he's doing. Not. At the end of the day, not everybody's Paul Mellon, are they? You know? No. No. He was on Epstein's list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but me off people first. around and get them to come home and stop <laughs> playing <touch. laughs> So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, you're like W.A. Gladstone when he used to go out looking for ladies of the night. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> the dubious virtue. Yeah. Or Bob Ogden's party. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, not going on there. <laughs> no, shame. So, Neil Tolson's commented, good comments from Neil. I like Neil, he, he, good listener of the show. Crudus highlighted the industry problems when he said he's only accountable to his shareholders, which is correct. He basically said, fuck the industry. The <laughs> industry hopes to reform the levy until the industry acts as a PLC and runs its own betting. There is no positive future, just hand to mouth existence. Absolutely spot on, Neil. But as James Knight has pointed out to me on numerous occasions, I live in fantasy land with the racing-owned betting exchange and Turt, which I actually agree with him. He's completely correct in that yeah. that is one million to one to happen. 
Yes. It's an idea. It doesn't mean to say it's a bad idea, though. I think it's a terrific idea. And the more I think about it, the more I think, well, that's the answer. Yeah. You know, it'll be near on impossible to, to obtain consensus. But that, that's the way you solve it. I mean, when you consider that ARC have got 35% of the fixture list, they are behemoths of the... It's the, uh, it's the ideal amount to trim the fixture list, actually, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Get rid of art. No, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely serious here as well. I agree. I agree. But then, what about the people that say, John? Well, then the turnover goes down, so there's there's less levy. How do they know it goes down? Good point, because people's always got so much money to spend. Yeah, and um, if the racing is a better product throughout the week, due to the fact we've trimmed it down and uh, it's more competitive, why wouldn't turnover go up? Yeah. I mean, they're not struggling for turnover in Ireland. Nobody's complaining over there. Well, certainly not as much as they are over here. They don't yeah. have as much racing as we do by a side. That is the BHA's big negotiating point. But they won't do it because nobody has a bottle. Because what they should have sent the critters was, well, yeah, that's all right. Yeah. But how do you think your art tracks will do if we take the licenses away? Yeah, yeah. True, true, true enough. You'd be flat. And you no longer race under the rules of racing. They, they would yeah, it's flapping, all right, yeah. yeah, yeah. they have to go flapping, but oh, oh, he's going to go flapping with their no. horses and the cab no on a normal track. No way. No, absolutely not. Because the impact on paddock values and the old black tie and all those kind of interrelated issues, no one would support that. Who wants to run your, you know, 200 grand all set of flap? Yeah, Nobody. But, so, there, there, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, that, that's the negotiation position that the well, BHA could have taken. And so, well, look, I think if you're not going to cooperate, you're no longer licensed. So we're going back to the big Excel bully required for the, well, for what, the job. Well, what, this what was never need? going to be achieved by consensus. No, it, yeah, you exactly. always you have need a leader. You need leadership. Racing pulling apart. And yeah. you can't have it, people just saying, oh, we all need to come together. It's not going to fucking work. No. Management by consensus rarely works. You know, you have to set the strategic objective. And BHA they have to say, look, you know, we are the product, you work for us, this is how it's going to be. And you have to bring them into line. I know it's glib and easy. It's so great ranks. I mean, imagine, imagine the people in Doncaster standing for the ledger being shifted to York. Yeah. Which yeah. you just go straight away in negotiations because Crudders would say, oh, well, you were all this classic here, so we're not anymore, it's going to York, mate. Except, of course, management by consensus works as a group. Of course, Bar Stewart's Edge. Shameless plug here. Come on and join Patreon on Bar Stewart's Edge, where we're enjoying a stellar time in the, on the tipping front. Absolutely. Daily advice. It's fantastic value on Patreon. The lot of us, me, John, Quentin Franks, Chris Gartner, Andy Richmond, Adam Norman, the lot of us, uh, Nick Davis, Jack Reach, all chipping with profitable bets over the course of the season. And we're doing about 18% on investment at 11 a.m. prices, folks. Where are you going to get that at 11 a.m.? You ain't getting it. You might get it overnight, and you might get it at 9 a.m., but your account will last two days. Yeah, no even money Appleby chances either. Unraced rubbish that other people charge for. None of that crap. Yeah, it's certainly worth joining, so please support us in our work, what we do there, because we do not answer to anyone. We don't get no bookmaker, although somebody gave me a million, and I might consider it. (laughs) <laughs> the Tomo yeah, yeah. coming out again. <laughs> yeah. Channel your inner Tomo. Indeed. Right. So interesting from Chris Forsett on Twitter and some figures here which defend the bookmakers. And I, I, I agree with this. Chris Forsett produced some figures. I underestimated the media rights racket that's going off at the moment, which is 3% on turnover. So imagine the scenario, folks. Big racing favourite punter. He bets we whoever, Entain, Flutter, whoever, right? He stakes 10 million a year on Favs, loves the Favs, loses 4% of his money, which approximately you'd do back in Favs. He's lost 400 grand on an average year. So the bookie costs, gross profits tax, 15% profit, that's 60 grand. Levy, 10% profit, 40 grand. Media rights, 3% on turnover, 300 grand. The punt has lost 400 grand, but the bookies had to pay out 400 grand. That's why accounts are getting closed as unprofitable, despite punters in despair going, well, I'm not a winner. Why am I closed? And I, I genuinely think that the expenses on the other side are making the horse race, racing game very unattractive for the big pop. And to back this up, AK Bets tweeted me a couple of days ago and said, 
all you've got to do is Google like Irish commercial property, and eighty percent of it is Paddy Power trying to sell. How do you? Exactly. So again, look into your crystal balls. Look at what we've done as a podcast for the last three years and how we've predicted things, what will happen, right? The fact that this is taking place shows you that even Big Corp know where this game is going to end up. And it's not good. It's not good. I'm, I wish I could paint a better picture of it. So defence for the books there. The expenses are incredible. Everyone needs to sit around the table and make this all work, because there is enough money to make it work. That's the frustrating thing. But yeah, that's that that's an interesting, and on the bookmaker's side of things. James Knight's always asking me for a solution. And John, I think it was like two years ago, I said on this pod, to much derision after the show, by the way, I stated that punters should pay something like between 1% and 2% yeah, of I their agree. winning towards I'm, the I'll be fine with that. Hmm. The reason being is that, if everyone's got to come to the table and deliver money for racing to keep the show on the road, if you like, to keep Billy Smart Circus going, right, mm. we have to also contribute to that. What do I do on Betfair. I pay 2% commission on every bet. Your tip shop staff, if you won five grand on a lucky 15 and you knew the counter woman or, or whatever, or the counter fella, you, you'd say it is 20 quid or it is 50 quid. Go and, five quid. Yeah, go on out. <laughs> But whatever, it, it, you're still going to tip the, the staff, I think. It's a done thing, and I think it's, it's goodwill. And I also think that this really needs looking at in, as a potential solution. So, James Knight, is this a good solution? You work for Entertain, as Vaughan Lewis, who's trolled me on Twitter and gave me some jib about solutions, etc. Well, what's wrong with that one? One to two percent, depending on how successful you are as a punter. It could even be up to the bookmaker that, that could even say, so a bet three, six, five, or Coral. Rather than refusing your account because you're unprofitable, if you're helping pay the levy that they don't have to pay, that's saving them eckies. It's still providing the sport, but you're paying for it because you're no, good. If I bet with Coral and, and they say, right, we don't really want to lay your big bets, but we'll lay you a couple hundred quid or something, but you will be paying three or four percent on your bets that will go directly to racing. You're winning bets. Now, that probably could work. It's something to look at. Don't forget, we did it back in the day. We, remember, Chris, John, we paid betting tax. Yeah, we did. Um, 9%. Yeah. yeah, and it funded the sport. Right. Yeah. And a recent example with a race value, I think there was a recent race value at Wolverhampton that was 3,700 to the winner. I think Saturday night, was it? I can't remember. 30 years ago, the same race at Wolverhampton, well, not exactly the same race, but the opening race 30 years ago was 3,100. Inflation takes that to 6,300. So it should be 6,300 to the winner. You can see how owners, trainers are just basically getting completely fleeced. But that's where we're at. Right, enough of industry, but hopefully we've covered a few topics there. Questions, yes. Ready Reckoner. <laughs> this is quite funny. Back on where they are now theme. A Betfair forum version from 20 plus years back would be a good start. War a cunt. Ibrahim Sonko. Alcyon Days, etc., etc. I'll start us off, and then we can all have some fun. Barton Bank, that's Matt Taylor, and he still owns us as we Appleby. He was the first ever punter on Betfair to win a million pounds. Was he? Yes. Crikey. Bloody hell. He was the first to strike the big seven figures. He's, oh. he's still around now with Mick Appleby. Yeah, good stuff from, from Matt Taylor. Bernard Mara, he did Colossus Bets and all that lot. He was called The Magician. And he actually, really? yeah, he, he actually invented the cash out. That's another mm. one. Warwick Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. But he actually got shot outside the Teesside in running Hell. betting exchange. His name is Stephen Porter. He's quite well documented, but Stephen's quite funny. He's quite very brash. I've, I've met him once. I went to the cricket for England, Australia at, at the Riverside at Durham. He's quite a character. I'll not say any more. The vet, he was another one that, that I knew. He was a good ground punter, very good ground judge. He married a Thai girl. A few of them have done. Got a long story short on that. You know, one of my favourite lines were, yeah, yeah, she's back in Thailand. She's asked me to send her a load of cash. I says, oh, why? She says, uh, pigs fell down well. Send oh, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Great stuff. And then, of course, last but not least, you've got Andy L. The king of Betfair uh, was Andy L. The Ethiopian... Hooker, basically, he got himself attached to. And the story behind that was he was flying at the time. He was flying in running, the old in running days where you could bet on track and get a big advantage. He got involved with this Ethiopian hooker and uh, said 
all the family had got money troubles, problems, and he and he sent her forty grand. Oh, dear. <laughs> Uh, Any old John, you you were. I don't know how much is a trick in Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> you get a lot for forty G's. Oh, it's a shame, isn't it? These people fall for this nonsense. Don't yeah, I? Yeah. I used to know a chap that was a a very senior uh, bank manager at NatWest, retired early, uh, put his kids through you know private school, university. Got divorced, had a lovely house on the Wentworth Estate, where the golf course, before it became sort of billionaire territory. And he used to spend his days playing a bit of golf in the morning, a bit of tennis in the afternoon, maybe a meal out once or twice a week with a lady friend. And then, you know, he used to play tennis with him. One day, he, he said something to me that made my blood chill. He said, oh, I, I won't be around for the next few weeks. I'm like, oh, so going on holiday. I said, oh, going anywhere nice. Oh, he said, I've met this wonderful girl, he said, uh, in Thailand. Oh, for fuck's sake. So he came back a month later, giddy as a schoolgirl. Oh, she's wonderful. I'm going to marry her. She's, you know, this is great. Anyway, he goes out there. The woman gets pregnant, brings her over. Uh, and all of a sudden, drip, 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 mother and father come over and live with him. Uh, grandmother, brothers, uncles, dirt, and all the whole lot. So now he's got this house. He's got like 15 people in it. And, you know, and he's a, quite a wealthy guy, but not wealthy enough to, to keep 15 people. So anyway, he goes out to work and one day he comes back and he finds his his bride seemingly shagging her brother on the on the sofa. And he, he's lost his shit. And apparently, guess what? It's not her brother. It's her Thai husband that's been living <laughs> under his roof. And the last I heard of it, actually quite a sad story. It was a bit in the paper. He'd obviously been driven out of his own house, got, had, didn't have any legal advice. And she ended up occupying this house and he ended up in a retirement flat in Brixham in Devon. And he was bound over to keep the peace by trying to march, trying to get a coach up to, to Wentworth with a sawn off shotgun and, and a tennis bag to blow her brains out. Completely lost his shit. The guy absolutely lost it. All for the power of the hairy magnet, boys. Just leave it alone. <laughs> it's just, there's no good ever comes of it. Trust me. Just have a uh, bit of Battenberg and a cup of tea, and that's your lot. That'll absolutely. Battenberg is. is... It's fine. John, anything on Betfair Forum stuff back in I, the day? I used to follow that John Joe bloke. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> you were legendary on there. He was. Who was your favourite Betfair Forum person, John, that you liked to interact with you back then? Herbie. Herbie, yeah. Did he go bananas? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That was my big project, really, sending him around the twist. <laughs> <laughs> and who can forget, of course, PP King and Ace Form and Alan Charney at Geneva, where people. Big nose, Dave. Yeah, but what yeah. was that about? I remember. I mean, I wasn't an avid user, but all these characters used to come out with like secret information. Was it? Was it? Who, who was it? Any ideas who that character was? Well, PP King had have, have several nom de plumes where he, like there was Alan Charney at Geneva, where he, <laughs> he, he, he was trading from his Switzerland uh, a bird. Like he always used to like wind Ace Form up, you know, like a, a regular punter and. Particularly like Ace Former put tips up. One day Ace Former tipped this eleven to ten chance up at Musselburgh. And it basically it it jumped a fence and just basically landed on the fence and sat on it. It, oh. it did so PP King's reply to him is but Ace Form, your horse appears to have sat on a fence. <laughs> <laughs> the banter between them two was fantastic. But great days back in the old days, if you were around for Betfair Forum in those days. Right, we move on. And a, a question on Twitter doing the rounds is how would you price up Constitution Hill if Maxwell's on Constitution Hill and Town End on State Man, John? Christ <laughs> almighty. Um, cool. That's a variable, isn't it? Constitution Hill can probably cart Maxwell and win. Yeah. yeah. As, long as, as long as Maxwell didn't try to ride any, any sort of clever race and drop him in or anything, I think he'd be all right. He'd just let him go. Yeah, we aren't betting on it, though, are we? God, no. <laughs> It's a wealth war. It's, you cannot back David Maxwell. I mean, bl- bless him. When he when he has his winners and he's planning into the game, and, and he, I can't say it's happening anyway. Yeah, yeah. You just, you just. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Final question before we end the show: Who are the people on normal television that you truly cannot stand <laughs> when they appear, and you mutter no. expletives to yourself and make your you shake your head repeatedly? Samuel the cat says, "Is he's like mainly Michael McIntyre." I'll be honest, chaps, I do not watch TV these days. I'll confess to what I watch on mainstream TV. It's Eurovision, I'm a celebrity in sport. I will not watch anything else on mainstream TV. So I do not know 
what anything is happening other than that. That is literally my barrier. So I have to sit this one out in terms of I can't. You I just can't watch, watch Alex Jones on YouTube, don't you? All the old cons- Yeah, David Icke, Bob Lazar. And a tinfoil sheet, honestly. I do. I, I do. Your mind. I, I do. My, my bed sheets are tinfoil uh, as, as well. <laughs> <laughs> He's got electric blankets, so he pisses yeah. himself, he poaches himself. Because I'm like I'm a Christmas turkey sat under this. <laughs> so that, that's where I'm at. Uh, mainstream's done for me, but so John. Chris, I want to know what you what really boils your piss on telly. Christ, I mean, it's practically everyone, to be honest with you. I, I, I have to. I mean, I don't. I, I too don't watch a huge amount of TV live. I watch a lot of streaming stuff, but practically every kind of format magazine program presenter, I have a visceral hatred of. So the one show, I think that's a pile of shit, and all the people on it are piles of shit. Don't like that. Don't like Richard Bacon. He, he pops up now and again presenting stuff. I find him unbearably smug but yeah I, I, I to be honest with you don't watch a lot of it but but that which i do see i don't like anybody so that's me yeah yeah we just don't like people no um, <laughs> oh, um, but dogs actually i might prefer animals but absolutely john I'd, I'd be very much in chris's camp with despising most of them um but those that i would reserve extra special wrath for would be uh richard madley yeah isabel oakshot yeah, and Anthony Warrell Thompson. Yeah, is that the chef? It's Anthony the Warren. chef that looks like a garden gnome. Mm. <laughs> well, two of those were done for nicking, weren't they? Richard Madeley and uh, yeah. Warrell Thompson. Yeah, I, yeah, I can't be. I can't be the only shoplifters. Do, do, do you know that photo that went around on on social media with Richard Madeley and Judy? We we Richard with his phallus out and it was photo mm. shop, but it was one of the best photos I've ever. John, you've seen it, haven't you? I have, yes. Yeah, like he's, he's hilarious. I, you know, somebody should post that on our timeline. No, 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 I'm kidding. Anyway, <laughs> no, don't do that. We've yeah, yeah, already yeah, these people yeah. being shoplifters. I've no evidence <laughs> to support that, but they look like shoplifters. So yeah, that, yeah. that's good enough. No, but mainstream tellies for, for fools, really. Dumbing down society. Look at your Saturday night programming. You've got oh. Mass Dancer and something else. And oh, that's rubbish. Mass Singer. I, I don't know. No idea. Garbage. It's just boring. Yeah, it's racing where we're at this year so hopefully you've enjoyed this one me john and chris will be back same time next week we're also back on friday with the friday show i think chris gartner's uh with me john and andy to go through the weekend action other than that we're doing a, a midweek madness on patreon that's seven pounds to join for the cheapers bit tight the, asses. The, there will be a midweek madness this week on wednesday discussing some various topics and having some fun so that's all from us Bye for now.